I'm super excited to kick off this uh, Tipco Analytics Forum hackathon uh, with the winners of the hackathon. Uh, we had a very challenging data set uh, focused on analyzing wind power production in Texas uh, using real world data from sources like um, ERCOT, the Electrical Reliability Council of Texas and, uh, and NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, and the goal was to estimate and model wind power production from weather patterns and, and wind, wind farm uh, metadata. Um, and the, the uh, contestants were um, given the data set and uh, pretty much uh, just spot fire and whatever else they wanted to bring to bear um, uh, in the surround of spot fire. Uh, and uh, they were able to do an amazing job in a short amount of time. And we're gonna feature some of those results today. Uh, I'm joined here by Neil Kanungo, um, AKA Dr. Spotfire, uh, and uh, Sweta Kotha, um, Senior Data Scientist on the TIPCO team. Uh, Neil and Sweta organized the hackathon, uh, and uh, I joined them in the judging of, of the hackathon. Uh, and we have winner, with us uh, the winner of the hackathon, Jolene Robertson from uh, Canada, Calgary. We have uh, second place winner, Ryan Hartquist, uh, here from uh, Oklahoma City. We have third place winner, Jade Liu, also from uh, Alberta, uh, Canada. Uh, and we have uh, fourth place uh, winner, Braden Gilchrist, who uh, lives these days in Denver. Hi, Braden. Uh, so we're gonna go through uh, the exercise, bring up the data. Neil's gonna walk through uh, you know, the questions and, and the generic solution uh, to the questions. Uh, and then we're gonna bring up the hackathon winners, um, Spotify analyses in turn and go through some of the things that we really liked about them. Neil and Sweater and I will give that commentary that we did when we were judging them. Uh, and then we're gonna throw open each contestant's uh, analysis for them to chat about and for the other winners to also uh, provide some comments on. So with that, Neil, I think I'm just gonna turn it over to you to bring up the hackathon exercise and, and the generic solution. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Yeah, and for those uh, that are gonna be watching this, uh, our goal is to show you something really cool that you can do with Spotfire, a uh, really powerful geoanalytics tool uh, and tip, and uh, give you some tips with some data wrangling as well. We also wanted to expose some of the thought processes from these different uh, winners. Uh, and so we can hear a little bit about how they approached it and uh, you know how they made certain decisions in solving the challenges. So with that, let me go ahead and show you the uh, analysis and so this is our solution of uh, what will really, what the uh, analysis is, is a hackathon that's exploring the wind use, uh, the wind energy in Texas. So taking wind energy from NOAA, um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Agency, and that is at different weather stations. And then we have different wind plants that are all across the Texas region and they have equipment like turbines on them and how do we combine this together and how do we determine how much energy, how much power is actually being generated at each of these wind turbines? So the first exercise was really just to set the stage for the uh, participants and get them to think about the data that was available. So there were data sets again in, um, there's an ERCOT CDR zone. This is a spatial data set. There were the NOAA weather data, and this is for uh, a lot of variables and metrics for individual weather stations. Um, there was the Texas wind plants as well as the turbines that were used. Um, then there were the turbine uh, power curves and we'll talk a little bit about what those power curves mean uh, as I go through this. So the first one, really I just threw together some, you know, very basic uh, exploratory stuff, just visualizing the wind direction, the distribution of wind, what the median wind was like, uh, wind speed was like throughout the um, throughout the year and how that varies with direction and speed uh, and location. And I really, on this one, uh, when Sway and I were designing it, we, we really didn't want to do too much in terms of solution. We want to keep this very open-ended because we wanted the participants to use their creativity and wow us. There was kind of a minimal requirements of information that needed to be conveyed, but there's a lot of data that I showed you that could be used. So that was the first exercise, just set a contextual uh, descriptive dashboard. Now the next was to start to push the contestants towards the uh, mapping the data spatially and thinking about the wind patterns in combination with the wind farms. So this asked them to go ahead and geospatially communicate the weather stations, 
wind farms, the CDR zones from ERCOT, and a, a spatial heat map, which requires the use of a spatial heat map data function, which you can find on the TIBCO exchange for free. Uh, this is an R-based data function. You just plug into Spotfire, and then you uh, get this spatial heat map capability. So it required the participants to know how to do that, to go download that, and know how to configure a data function. And so this is a little bit of what that could look like. Um, let me go ahead and turn on my layers control. So in the background, you'll see these ERCOT zones. I'm going to turn that off so we can see the results of the spatial heat map. And you'll see this contour is done by a low S smoothing. Um, we talk about in our blog, which I'll point to you in a second. Um, but these triangles are the weather stations. So you have these set points surrounding Texas where the weather is actually measured. The wind is measured, temperature, humidity, cloud cover. Uh, these type of weather stations. Um, and a fun fact, I actually did my graduate research on environmental degradation of polymers, and I was at the Houston one and the Lubbock one, and I saw all the equipment there where I set up my equipment apparatus. Uh, now, these uh, gray dots are just the various wind plants around Texas. So you can see the wind plants, they have the turbines, but they don't have the wind. The wind is, is uh, decoupled from it. So by creating a surface here, a three-dimensional surface, where you have latitude, longitude, and wind speed, you can see what the granular wind speed is near these uh, individual wind farms, but you can't quite use it yet. So first you're visualizing it. And then the next one was to actually spatially interpolate it. And so this is a data function uh, that was put together by Sueda. And this uses the same low S uh, method to build a model object in R and then generate a prediction. And then that is fitted, and uh, that spatial interpolation essentially takes the surface that you've generated. Go ahead and load this. The surface that you've generated, there's all these bright colors, and it brings it down and lays that on the wind plants, uh, so, uh, the wind farms. So now the wind farms have a very granular and accurate representation of what the average wind speed was during whatever time span you're giving it. So that was a big trick there. That was a, a really uh, powerful feature, and that was the, the big analytics trick to do. Now, next, we wanted to just kind of communicate what a wind uh, power curve was. And so equipment like compressors and pumps and turbines, they have what's a, a power curve, what's called a power curve, and that means at various wind speeds on this x-axis you have wind speeds you'll have different power that's generated so each turbine model is quite different they're optimized for certain wind speeds you can see at 12 mile per hour winds the siemens uh, uh wind turbine produces around uh, uh, uh 13 um or around 13 miles per hour winds it produces 2295 kilowatts of power uh this mitsubishi is going to be much lower at a thousand and then this gamesa is at uh, which one is this at 4,500? So depending on the environmental conditions and what the um, operators and engineers have put in, you're going to get different power generated per uh, wind farm. So once that's well understood and just visualized, uh, next is to actually bring that together. Um, so the wind data, or sorry, the power curve data was at half mile per hour intervals in terms of these curves. Uh, there was a data point every half mile per hour interval. And you could generate an equation for this curve and do it more granularly, but what we did is just say, hey, round your wind speeds to a half mile per hour and then match that with uh, match that with the turbines and figure out which are the, um, let me see, total power produced. Let me go ahead and put that in on size, make this a little bit easier to see. There we go. So then you can actually see which wind plants generate the most power and uh, take a view that way. And the trick here is that, so let's go through the data transformation process. So you have um, these contours that are created by your, your heat map data function. You have a, a heat map as well. So those are two uh, geospatial objects that are overlaid to give you that surface. Um, and then you have uh, your uh, wind plants themselves and on these wind plants, uh, you have you have this uh, interpolated wind speed that's generated from a data function. So if I go to this low S prediction and I go to information, this is coming off of our, our data function that does a spatial interpolation. So that's configured 
for the R script. It creates a column output here for the actual localized wind speed at each of these individual plants. And then the next thing is just to use a calculated column to round these. So I rounded these to zero. You could also round them to a half mile per hour. And so once you've rounded them, now you have something you can join with the uh, turbine power curves right here. So these are the turbine power curves out of the wind speeds. Now, a little, you know, a little trick here, a little gotcha is that you can't join two tables together in Spotfire off a data function resulting column or a calculated column. And the reason is because those columns are dynamic. And so you with the way data functions work, you can adjust sliders and you can change the calculations. And if that is going to be part of a join, that can create instability in some and in some ways the DXP is used. Um, and uh, same thing with calculate columns, they're dynamic. So the way to approach that is to um, actually bring the table and you can do a linked data table. So you go add, you go to other, and you can go to a linked to a copy of the data table the analysis. And then you can grab that wind plant data and bring that in. And then that brings this in as a, uh, a loaded column instead of a calculated column or data, res data function resulting column. The other way you could have done it is by using the freeze function to the column properties, the column properties, and I will go to the wind plants, excuse me, wind plants, and you have this result column, this calculated column, you see there, you can actually freeze that, and that will prevent it from dynamically recalculating. Uh, so that's another way you could have done it, and then the third way I thought of that you could do it is you could have just exported your resulting table here, you could just export this to an SBDF binary file, export to a CSV, and then re-import it into your analysis. And then that would have allowed you to do the join that was necessary to join the, um, the wind curve, power curve data to the wind plant data. So this is that join by generator ID and the wind speed. You're able to get a uh, result of the power generated as well. Um, so that's the uh, summary of the uh, results. Uh, we did put this into a blog on LinkedIn. I'm going to put that into the video description of the YouTube video. Uh, we also have other technical blogs you can check out on the community. I'll put that into the video description as well. So with that, why don't I go ahead and open it up for the, um, for the different solutions. Uh, Michael, did you want to comment or did you? you know, no, I just... think let's just start with uh, Jolene and uh, we'll just work our way through. But I think that was a good, you know, good overview, interesting data set, some interesting little tips and tricks there that you need to uh, figure out to join, uh, join the data and uh, make the data functions work dynamically as well as have the results join into the rest of the data set. So, uh, yeah, let's just go through starting with uh, Jolene. Yeah, Jolene, why don't you tell us a little bit about um what you enjoyed with this, what you hated, and <laughs> what was challenging for you, and and how you came across, how you came up with this uh, solution dashboard. Um, I guess just finding ways to. Well, I was interested in the whole mods piece, and it was you know it's a very exciting new feature of of Spotfire that I uh, tried to play around with a bit. So on the I think it's the first tab, I added the spider chart. And in addition to that, I also created a, um, a column for the cardinal direction that I use an expression function for to get the, the north, northeast, east, uh, south, southwest, stuff like that. And um, so, and I use uh, some property controls to kind of give the, the end user some flexibility to, to plot different values on, on the spider chart without directly going into the visualization and, and making those updates. So um, for, for example, if you have the metric, select metric Y axis, yeah, whatever you select on the, the right, the different um, measurements and then you can if you want to plot it against like the seasons or the directions or even the the oh i think i took out the weather station one but yes you can filter by the the stations and then the kpi chart above the uh just the bar chart there it, just a quick way if you if you drill into it then it will kind of show you um what everything looks like during each of the seasons with the the average wind speed for that season and then I, I also added the um, little property control to switch your time series on the bottom for
for the daily, weekly, monthly. So that was useful on that one question that asks which had the highest month of uh, top, top speed or whatever like that. So um, yeah, and then I linked the, so if you drag the date slider across the bottom, I stretched it out kind of so, so that uh, people can kind of see that it will drive both visualizations at the same time. And then if you click the reset button um, at any point that will just reset your markings and any uh, filterings that you have. Um, and then of course, if you're interested in seeing what the actual data points look like, you can mark um, the uh, data point of interest and you can, can click on the, the, the data button on the top right to just uh, quickly um, pop open the details on demand. And so, um, what I usually keep in mind when I'm trying to build things like this, you know, rather than having a drill down table that takes up extra space, um, one thing that I've, you know, discovered over the years is that real estate's precious and I don't like to clutter things too much. So I like to be able to keep it clean and, and not like totally um, overbearing with too much content so that it is confusing to look at. So the, I felt that the, the quick button to pop open the data panel was a, a good, quick, easy way to be able to get that information without having to sacrifice um, real estate on the page. Mm -hmm. And we so- like, We really um, like that, by the way. We liked the um, way you created this as more than just a dashboard, but an application where you have a lot of options to explore things uh, as well. Uh, yeah, I really felt like- sure felt like you put your, your, yourself in the shoes of the user to be able to you know, move the date slider, um, get the drop downs easily on the left-hand chart, um, update the uh, KPI chart and uh, you know, be able to navigate uh, the Y variable on the spider plot and so on. Yeah, but, uh, yeah I, I think it was nice the way you kept the end user in mind uh, and, and their, their experience. Thanks. If you click the double arrow um, between the two property controls, that's just a quick way to toggle. Oh, we didn't even know. I that. didn't even see that. <laughs> so, Jolene, Jolene, I was, I'll say that that was um, my absolute favorite part of anyone's analysis was that control right there. <laughs> That's <laughs> cool. Going through and um, the, and it just made a great, incredible use of the spider. I mean, it was, it was you already you already had a great use of the spider chart to begin with, but then adding that control was just brilliant. So, great job on that. Thank you. I mean, I, Ryan, you mean the control to flip um, at the top, the, the drop? Yes, the top? yeah, the blue, the blue arrows on color by and, and X axis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. so it's just, uh, just kind of different ways to um, look at the information. And it's, it's, pretty, 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 anyway. neat the way, it's pretty neat the way the mods graph um, graphs allow you to, uh, you know, just treat them like any other visual. Uh, yes. Like a spot fire, right? One thing that I found um, challenging with the, uh, like the JS Viz is depending on what you're trying to do is to get, to link it up with the marking. Um, uh, so I like the fact that it already does that. Mods does, mm -hmm. yeah. The older JS Viz had a lot more kind of coding and configuration and yeah. now Spotfire has, uh, with Spotfire 11, there's visualization mods where there's custom visualizations that can be put in like a word cloud and these act like native visualizations with uh, your standard controls and marking yeah. and things like that. So yeah, yeah, I think that's great. And I'm really happy to see that there's been this added flexibility for visualizations. It's one of the things that I've um, I've been trying to do from very early on. I started developing in Spotfire in version 3.3. Oh wow! So, um, back then things were. Um, not as nice looking as they are now. And <laughs> <laughs> as soon as they, you know, brought in the ability to get rid of the borders between your, um, like when you had more control over the, your themes and stuff like that, I thought that was, that was great. And to be honest, as soon as I found out that I can copy the content of an Excel and paste it into a text area and for it to retain its formatting and everything, that was a, a game changer for me. Okay. It completely opened up an entirely different um, perspective on on this tool, which is, I think, why I'm so drawn to it, because there's so much you can do with it um, creatively and uh,
Let's yeah. show uh, let's show exercise three. I think was the other one we paid you really well. Yeah. Right. Oh, cool. yeah, and by the way, also, also just quick I'll, for any of these anyone interested in these visualization mods, I'll also put a link to the open downloadable mods you can get for free. I'll put that in the YouTube video descri description as well. Okay. Um, but this is uh, I think this is Michael the one that uh, and Sueda, This is the one that really wowed us because we felt like it was just so analytical and so to the point and. Uh, had nice touches, right? Like the contour smoothing. I like I the fact that because the contour smoothing parameter on the slider there for the end user to look at different values of the smoother, that was kind of nice. Yeah, for analysts or data scientists, this page really had it all. And I think that's what really captured our attention from this whole dashboard. Um, just being able to drill down and seeing how all the data changes um, dynamically. This is like a one-stop all for us. That's great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the use yeah. of the reference, the reference lines that, um, on the uh, on the trellis plot on the lower right. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I just moved this, and sometimes this takes a little bit longer when I'm sharing on Zoom. But you you see the contour lines changed, but then Jolene had actually linked this all the way downstream. So the contour lines and the map and, and the surface is one data function, and then there's a separate data function that does the interpolation of that onto the wind farms. So both of those updates. So she had one update, which is the visualization of surface, the second one update, which is the interpolation. You saw both of that happen by just moving a slider. Um, but yeah, then Michael, sorry. Yeah, you were just saying the contour lines, right? Or not starting the contour lines, the reference oh, no, lines. I just, I just like the fact that the trellis, the adornments on the trellis plot on the lower right, um, I, I found the, you know, the adornments there to just the, the responsive, you know, being able to quickly know where you were on those power curves. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I think um, so. We didn't ask anyone to use the cutoff speed, which is the uh, basically at a, a certain wind speed, the turbines are braked and shut off. There's a brake on them, and that's to prevent them from damaging themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a cutout speed, and uh, yeah, Jolene, I think you took it a, a, a upon yourself to go ahead and add that line in there, and also add a line for the the maximum amount of uh, uh, power that could be generated. I think as a user, you're always trying to look at, okay, how do I compare this to this? There's a lot of comparative stuff goes on in my head when I'm looking at an analysis and, uh, you know, judicious choice of, uh, well, firstly, the navigation across the top is nice, but then, you know, being able to look at different um, power curves and have in your head what the other one looked like and be able to do a sort of a comparative analysis as you're visualizing, uh, as you're moving around the application is useful. Uh, another thing that I added to the, the tree map was like the, the count of units. Um, oh, I see that, yeah. yeah the, number so of, uh, the number of turbines for each yeah. model, right? Yeah. So that's just, just some additional information that I added into the expression. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I find that the tree maps is a, is a great substitute, even for like a legend as well, because you can, um, you, you can have control over like the, the gradients of it and like the, the text inside the labels. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you, you know, being able to um, group them and have the hierarchy is, is, it's just a, it's a quick way. I call them soft filters when I, when I, um, set something up for a client, I'll, I'll have hard filters and then I'll have soft filters. And the soft filters, I just will say that's just your marking. It's just um, to quickly be able to drill in with a click. Whereas uh, the, the filter will be, you know, um, for, well, depending on how you have your filter set up, but usually I don't um, do too much in that regard. So I, I will keep the, the filter active throughout the whole analysis. So that if, for an example, they're only really interested in, in looking at like the GE power, for an example, they could filter that and then that would remain their filtered selection throughout the entire analysis. Whereas um, the marking would let them quickly do that without having to filter and unfilter and stuff like that. Well, great work, Jolene. Uh, you know, really uh, impressed us with a breadth of um, really a breadth of uh, experience here using good visual elements, visual style, controls, uh, analytics, uh, getting uh, good, accurate answers here, using the data functions in a very dynamic way with the smoothing, really impressive. Thank you, thank you so much.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was real. Uh, I think Suede, didn't we call it the most analytic of the entries, wasn't it? We, we, we yeah, that. yeah, we yeah. definitely did. And I think, again, that fourth page there really holds when it captures all our attention, um, really bringing the exercises of the hackathon together. Mm -hmm. So that was just great to see overall. And I, I love the like kind of almost small niche changes that you made to everyday spot fire visualizations that like almost transformed um, their purpose. And it was mm -hmm. great to see that with the mods as well as the regular visuals too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we move on to Ryan then, Neil? Yeah. So here's Ryan's and um, I'll start by saying um, just a little bit of what we, we loved about Ryan's was um, it is just a very complete application experience, lots of controls, good use of real estate. I believe this type of flexibility is not overwhelming to a consumer, but also uh, is expansive enough that over time, if the business has additional questions, they could just go ahead and change some of these settings and, and answer additional questions within the data. Um, and so that type of longevity would reduce the maintenance that you know, a, a BI developer or anal uh, analytics developer would need to, to kind of keep adding new features in. So this was a very feature complete and usable application. We liked the use of the uh, top here to um, have a little uh, uh, navigation, a storyboard mode. Um, we liked, uh, we really liked this use of the side-by-side -side bar charts as a way to communicate the power capacity, the rated power of a certain turbine versus what it's actually producing. And that was a very clear way to communicate that. Um, so Ryan, do you want to, you know, talk a little bit about, and I know you have an animation here and unfortunately, again, when I share on zoom, it, it tends to overwhelm my video, uh, my video card. And then, uh, it, it doesn't actually play that well, but. Um, yeah, people can play with that on their own with the links uh, from the blog. Yeah, so I think uh, yeah, you kind of, kind of just said my approach was to um, to create something that was very usable, something that would that looked aesthetic. Um, and so um, yeah, it was interesting because I there was somebody else that used the actual animated uh, mod um, for you know doing for visualizing the wind speed. And it was interesting because I, I actually had that in there first. And then I backed up and I thought, you know what, let's animate this along with the map. And I wasn't able to get it quite to work with the mod. So I was like, let me, let me swap this out. And so I wanted to animate it so that the map would also, um, would also behave the same way as the uh, mean wind speed by stationing there. Um, so um, yeah, just trying to add some controls for people. Um, uh, and kind of like Jolene said, I think it's, you've got, you've got a finite canvas to work with, right? Um, and so trying to, you know, add add controls where people can um, kind of pick and choose how they want to visualize things without um, cluttering things up. I think I, I really like using um, the accordion on the text area. I do that a lot just in general, just because uh, I think a lot of my users really like to have filters visible, um, but I hate just like either having the, the, the exhaustive filter panel open or just tacking on filters into a text area. Um, so I think this kind of does it in a little bit more elegant way mm -hmm. um, and while, while saving space too. So, um, and then just some, just a, a simple property control there to, to adjust that line graph. Um, I believe it changes the, I can't remember if it changed it to a trellis. Yeah, a trellis, yeah. Uh, Cause that was important too, I think to, to view that in that way. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, just so that, that was kind of my overall concept was, was to try to make it nice and polished. Um, yeah. So I think uh, I think yeah. I think Jolene did like, as I mentioned she was it was an incredible use of the spider the spider chart like looking back I was like man that was that would have been a great use of the spider chart <laughs> the way she used that um, <clears throat> so yeah that generally that you know I won't belabor some of the points that others have made about the data but um, that was kind of my concept um, you know and trying to keep things thematic uh, color wise. Um, um, and make it, you know, I think, I think generally with users and, and spot fighters a great job because you can really keep themes and, um, and other controls really you know, together and cohesive is that, you know, if it feels good to use, then users will want to use it. I think, you know, if, if a lot of folks that um, develop all the time with any application, but, you know, you, you have certain times where you make something for somebody and maybe it doesn't really look good or feel good. It's great data. It's great analysis. Um, but maybe it falls by the wayside because of that. And so I think that kind of comes to the forefront um, 
and Spotify does a great job of that. So, uh, um, yes, oh, go ahead, Michael. No, very good. I mean, again, I thought um, you know the you already pointed it out, Neil, but the uh, you know that side by side horizontal bar chart again, giving you the reference. You try and make comparisons and the you know observed versus expected or whatever else. I, I'm trying to I'm trying to draw inference out of an analysis when I look at it, and I, those sorts of things um, you know help just help me in that regard. So I, I always am biased towards. Uh, you know, being able to get inference from the from the visual analysis, and I thought you did a good job, Ryan, on the, as you look through rated versus produced power, as you look through the power curves, and and so on, and uh, just easy to use to open up the concertina um, controls and so on. So, yeah, good job. Thank you. So yeah, nice stuff. Good stuff. So we move into the into um, Jade's one, Neil. Or what's what do you want to do next? Uh, I think yeah, third place is Jade and. Jade, I think, was our first submission. It was very quick, right, you know, uh, right to the point with her results and uh, very concise. And I mean, Michael, did you want to say some points about that? And then we can hand yeah, over to Jade. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I was just really impressed when we saw Jade's submission that it just really hit the mark on all the questions. And it was, um, you know, simple and uh, elegant and concise. And uh, um, yeah, I think it was uh, uh, just to the point, I guess, was uh, was what I think we ended up give, giving it the most targeted award. It just kind of nailed the uh, nailed the questions in with minimum of kind of fuss. So uh, let's step through it. I think it was it's a, it was a really cool one. Yeah, honestly, like I was really happy that I even received any kind of award because I was thinking, oh well, I'm just doing it the simplest way possible. I'm not sure if that will be recognized, but you guys really saw um, what I was going for, and we're on the same page. So that that made me super happy. Yeah, yeah. But less, sometimes less is more, you know, sometimes it's, you know, it's elegant, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, that, that's the way I think. So my, my thought process for the, the whole hackathon and usually um, how I make my dashboards for clients, um, I do a lot of spot fire training and I'm working with people who are just starting out. So I don't want to make things too complex. I want it to be something that they can look at and be like, oh, I could have put this together. And oh, if I'm taking over this project, it's something that I can continue to support. There's no like mystery behind it. So that's how I try to keep things as simple as, as possible. Um, so there's, yeah, everything is just what was asked for in the hackathon. And when I was doing it, I was like, oh no, I have like a pretty busy day ahead of me today and tomorrow, and I'm not gonna have time to make it into those office hours. So I'm just gonna do everything that I can up front, answer all the questions and shoot it off. And I didn't know I was the first submission. So that's cool to hear. <laughs> That's no, great. Is there yeah. anything you want to highlight on the, on there, Jade or Sweta? Yeah, I was just going to say real quickly, um, I remember this being the first submission that came in. It also came in really, really fast. And I was looking through it super excited because we saw that all the uh, exercises were completed to a degree. And um, it was just great seeing how targeted it was um, off the bat. So like just looking at this page here, for example, without even knowing the questions, um, just like your use of colors in the table, for example, we can just clearly see how um, we're looking at like, you know, the, pr the predicted power and that's what we want to focus on here. So, you know, adding little elements of color here and there and keeping it simple with how many visuals we have per page really helps. Yeah, yeah it, was I, very, it was very Tufty-esque in that regard. You know, Tufty is kind of a minimal, minimalist where, you know, don't put anything ink on the paper if it's not kind of you know, targeted at the problem or the, or, or the inference uh, from the from the visual and, you know, I, I, so I even think that like if I if I was going to print this, I'm not going to use a dark theme because it's going to waste a lot of ink. So I'm only putting color where it needs where it absolutely needs to go. Even like the the date range right. filter that was actually added as an afterthought when I finished everything. I went back and I was like, well, I should probably demonstrate some skill in text area. So I just dropped that in. <laughs> and the final thing that I put in um, was actually those arrows and trying to get them pointing the right way. So looking at Neil's solution just now, I was like, oh, I think I got it in the right direction. I definitely spent like a good half hour. So searching like what was the correct way to do the calculation for it? Cause that was not part of the hints. Right. Uh, and, and I'll be honest, the first time I saw this, I was like, oh man, there's just like a lot going on. There's like these big arrows and there's like big circles. And then I took a step back and I was like, well, actually I kind of like it because it's it, it, it's emphasizing the key points that you want to communicate, right? Perhaps, when you make perhaps. everything kind of same size or small, then you're kind of searching around the page for out what's the important insight. Well, you just put the insight right there in the front. It's very clear. The 
first thing someone's going to do is you're going to ask, what are these arrows? What are these colors mean? And that's going to get them to their answer faster. And, and then light touches with your reference lines on your counties, choosing to make those white when you already have a white background, but doing that to shine through the, uh, the contour and surface that you've generated, the wind surface you generated is just nice touches you have there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. I really appreciate hearing that. <laughs> These are all things that I did think about <laughs> when I put it together. And it's just, ha I'm happy to hear that you saw the same. Yeah, for sure. Flip, want to flip through any other tabs? Or I want to jump to uh, Brayden's, Neil. Well, I think we should go ahead and jump to Brayden's, okay, uh, yeah. just to keep an eye on the time here. Um, Brayden, uh, you know, one thing that really, we gave you, I think, the most advanced award, uh, you know, fourth place, you got the most advanced award. And we noticed that you did a linear regression uh, to uh, evaluate temperature and its relationship to wind, and you use the out of the box uh, spot fire tools, uh, which are actually now in the flyout here. So you use a, uh, um, a regression modeling here across your variables, and you found okay, so temperature is related. And then you went ahead and used an animated mod here to show temperature and wind speed and how that went over time and. I would say this really wowed us. Uh, we were like, oh, this is kind of cool to watch. This is interesting as you watch uh, over the year, um, how these are kind of, you know, the temperatures going up, the wind speeds uh, changing and going down during that time. And we also like the uh, creative uh, choice of trying to visualize uh, the distribution of this wind over months in, a diff in different ways. So you have the seasons here and you chose to use jittery. Not a lot of people yeah. know about jittering that was a really uh, nice thing for us so if you don't have any jittering for those of us watching uh watching this if you don't have any jittering it's going to overlay all your points but if you're trying to better see the distribution of the data that's what a, a, a jittering is used in statistical visualization um so we really like that we like the colors and uh, how they popped out um but yeah maybe you can you know i'll hand it off and you tell us a, a little bit about your thought processes here yeah, and how you approached it from the beginning to start off, start off to uncover the relationships before you really got going with the analysis was a nice uh, nice touch. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's definitely one of the reasons I love using Spotfire. It makes that data exploration phase very easy. So in this competition, when you're just handed a few data sets where you know I wasn't too familiar with um, doing, you know, using the different data visualizations to kind of like figure out what made sense for the competition and then using the regression so I could actually tell a little bit of a story. That was mm -hmm. helpful. And then, yeah, I'm, I'm a sucker for that, uh, that animation chart. Like I'll, 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 you know, shoehorn that in every chance I get. <laughs> yeah. We've been using that on our COVID analysis. I don't know if you've seen that to look at the progression of uh, cases and versus vaccinations, but uh, yeah, it's nice to have that uh, date playing through in the background. So you can kind of, in this case, look at the seasonality of the relationship between temperature and, and wind speed, right? Yeah, I remember years ago, like kind of maybe maybe what Ryan did for the map visualization of like the, the old school way to get the, get things to animate in Spotfire. And this was way easier, just download the mod mm -hmm. and I added in like, you know, I was able to add that in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. It's an animated bubble chart mod. Uh, it was actually put together couple other people on the product develop team and it was inspired by uh, uh, Hans Rosling. Um, but no, it's really cool analysis, Braden. I, I really like the uh, depth of the quantitativeness of it. And that's a good point you raised there. I, I'm appreciative to understand your motivation. You wanted to look at the relationships before you started this because you had no idea what these data were, were about. It's not, wasn't something you were familiar with. You knew, knew how to start it. And so the idea of doing the out of the box uh, relationships, data relationships uh, gave you this table or this page that you put in as an appendix almost uh, that sort of drove your design for the analysis that's uh, that's that's pretty cool and i know uh, i think we missed john on the call but i uh, just want to highlight quickly his he gave him an honorable mention for the most aesthetic and john henderson of he's a chief analytics officer of entertel and has been a, a recent uh, guest speaker on dr spotfire as well as a speaker at TAF itself. And you should definitely check out John's presentation at TAF because he discusses things like typography, color theme usage, uh, advanced styling, all in his TAF session and a bit in the Dr. Spotfire session as well. Uh, but we wanted to highlight uh, some of the really cool aesthetics he did. I, I loved how he um, uses very electric looking 
uh, color scheme for the contours here and actually had uh, some of the, the lower uh, fifth uh, percentile of data is the same color as this background. So you're not even seeing it. You're really just seeing where the wind is, is strongest. And he custom made this background, this uh, layer here using Mapbox um, where you can get a you know a free account to Mapbox. You get um, uh, you can pay if you need more um, uh, more uh, users accessing your map tiles. But you can totally customize the backgrounds and the fonts uh, of, of the map background, and then bring that into Spotfire. And that's discussed uh, again in the Doctor Spotfire as well. Yeah, it really took me back to my childhood. I thought I was like at a psychedelic band, like you know, performance <laughs> or something. It was the, the light show or something like that, because it was like, yeah, this is electric, right? It's an electric presentation of. Uh, of this contour map um, with the color scheme and dark background and so on. So uh, yeah, it was it was yeah. cool aesthetically and uh, yeah, uh, overall. But look, I think we just all, uh, Sweda, Neil and I and the other judges, Andrew and Colin, really enjoyed going through the entries and uh, you all surfaced to the top. You know, we, we, we shot off the hackathon at 150, although somehow 163 people got in there. Uh, <laughs> and we had 60 or so people, you know, get in and work the data and and you folks all came to the top of the pack. So really super congratulations to, to all of you. Um, yeah, we, we really we really loved it. I think it was our best hackathon. Neil and I have been doing these hackathons, I think four or five years now at the Analytics Forum. And uh, this one I think was uh, was the best in, in my experience. What about you, Neil? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think uh, we're figuring it out a little bit more. We wanna make the hackathons more open-ended. There's always this kind of challenge between how do you grade objectively and how do you allow an open creativity, right? So a lot of hackathons are incredibly open-ended, but you know, since we have the prizes and limited time, things like that. So this time we took a step towards making it more open. Mm -hmm. And I think next year we'll do another step that direction um, because truly when we allow you to create using your mindset, your thought processes, you inspire us and show us things that we didn't even think about. And so we thank you for that and thank you for your participation. Uh, and uh, again, congrats, uh, sending that congrats to you as well. Terrific, any closing comments, Peter? Yeah, I mean, I just could not reiterate on that more. So like uh, creating this hackathon, we had a set of five structured exercises and you even kind of saw our standard solutions that we gave you. But I think um, all the participants here just went a above and beyond in terms of analytics, specializations, and really bringing something new to the community that we ourselves haven't seen before. So, I mean, great job. And we really hope to see you doing more of this work at future hackathons and uh, Spotfire events. Yeah, terrific. All the best, you guys. Great job. Uh, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.